You're going to see me real vulnerable, Jason. Mm -hmm. I'm already yeah. getting there. <clears throat> okay, we're going live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Our guest today is Shady Day Jesus. Shady, are you ready to be great today? Yes, always. Shady Day Jesus is a multidimensional, diverse superstar with demonstrated history working in national, global innovation networks, entrepreneurship, commercialization, venture capital, and alternative investments. She is currently the city lead for Bunker Labs Austin, the Soul Gal Austin City Lead, and a venture partner, Giddy Inc. Shady, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Great. This, I'm excited to be here too. So Shady, let's talk about some of the non-VC, non-tech. So somewhere, I think it's on your social media somewhere. I don't remember where I saw it. There's a picture of you in Alaska in your waders and a big <laughs> halibut. Tell that story. Yeah. So uh, I have obviously grew up with the guys. And so I'm very into the outdoors. Uh, that was one of my first fishing trips in Alaska. And uh, obviously you have to represent so Spurs uh, attire and my waders. Uh, and I actually caught an 80 pound halibut that day. And so it took me about 30 minutes to reel it in. Um, but if you imagine uh, deep sea fishing in Alaska, it's just one of those amazing experiences that you have to show off every now and then. Was that your first time doing that? Deep sea fishing? Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, when you're, when you're from Texas, like all you catch is like, what three inch yes. tilapia no just like those little <laughs> mini fish so it was really exciting um and obviously the guys wanted to you know reel the fish in themselves but i was pretty committed to showing them off so so um, how did you get involved in what you're doing now the tech field investments vc it's definitely been a long ride i'd say um early on in my career i started off in wealth and asset building. So it's the lower end of the spectrum. Um, when you're thinking about alternatives to VC and angel investing, there is just, you know, traditional lending. Uh, there's microfinance, depending on where you start. So I started my career off there, um, doing that nationally. And then as I moved across the country, I started picking up uh, from different ecosystems, the way that they um, both were engaged in tech and innovation as well as the different type of investment streams that they came through. So it's been like a 10 year journey. So what's your definition of tech? You know, it, I guess it really depends. So if on the region, um, I particularly, when I say tech, I just reference, um, you know, your computer software here in like the Austin region, right? They're heavy in tech. Um, and then uh, obviously innovation in other areas are, is going to be a little bit uh, different. Um, so I throw those in together, tech and innovation. Um, but most people, you know, are going to say that it's just strictly like software. Shady, can you talk about what is an investable company? Can you, you know, I think it's actually only 1% of companies actually get VC and that's really no guarantee of being successful anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. You know, all the hype, get VC, get VC. But from your point of view, what is an investable company? So obviously investments is gonna depend on the person providing the capital, right? Um, there's investable at, at different um, levels. And so depending on where your company is at in the stage, it's something that can return the growth. So depending if it's a 10X, if it's a you know 5X or a 3X return, um, it's, it's a company that is, you know, basically when you give them money, you're literally gonna be lighting fire to your company and the VCs are gonna want you to perform. And so what that means, it's you both, personally are ready to scale yourself. You're ready to manage a huge team. Um, and then also then go out and uh, capture customers. And so investable for that sense uh, would mean that you're ready to, you know, expand your company. So when you're personally looking at pitch decks, people are pitching you trying to, you know, get investment for you and your, you know, your network, what do you, what's your like focus point? Is it team? Is the, is a product? Is it, you know, traction? Is it combination or is it something totally different? For me, you know, since I'm in the early stage, you know, um, pre-revenue and, you know, some post-revenue there, I have such a wide experience that I can understand, um, it, even if someone is not pre-revenue, like where they can fit. Uh, so often you might see a one-time co-founder by himself, he's not 
probably capable of growing this company. Um, but you know that he can um, find a team and following. So for me, it's always a team. And then also like the depth of that relationship is to understand that they're going to be in it for the long haul. Uh, it's really easy, I think, to tell when people are in it just for the money um, or their perceived notion that, oh, I'm just going to get a million dollars and then, you know, things are just going to fly off, you know, from the get go. And, and that's really not it. Um, most folks that you can see, they've raised, you know, if even if they raise a series A or B, like they literally are still grinding it out. Like it's not uh, an investment is not a miracle. Right. Um, so for me, it's always team. Then obviously, um, basically the market itself, if it's, if there's leeway to like pivot into different areas, like that's always a positive. It's not like it has to be this one product and this has to work because if that fails, then everybody's, I guess, up shit's Creek, I guess yeah. is what it says, you know, both the investor and your, and yourself. Yeah, I think there's so many examples of failed investment, right? What's, I think Quibi raised like so much money, right? And they failed after six months and like if Quibi failed, like, you know, like, man, they had all this, you know, people on their side of this money come in and they still failed, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and when you see some of those companies, I think that's why it's really important for the founders to understand what type of capital and support that they need. Um, especially in this time, it's like there's a lot more uh, money flowing than, you know, obviously for the startups. And so you want to pick the right relationship. If, if sometimes VC will make you fail in a sense um, because they're expecting such uh, outsized returns that you're needing to ramp up your team, you're needing to ramp up the product in such a short amount of time that if you miss the mark, it's almost like you can't go back and reallocate the 1 million that they gave you. Like you're already in, you're in it. Yeah, you're a partner for life pretty much, right? Correct, correct. And, it, and you know, you get your investment in your driving and if, if you drive in the wrong direction, then it could cause you to fail. And so that's why sometimes you see large failures as well. So from your point of view, um, so how about this? So, and you know, they always say, you know, if you're, you know, for founder, you know, pick your VC correctly, pick the right one, but okay, right. Not many founders have the luxury of picking to two or three investors, right? They got to, you know, take the money, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So how do you protect yourself? You know, you, 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 you've been trying to fundraise, nothing comes up. Some person, some angel offers you like $300,000 for like 30% of your company, right? You're like, man, this is kind of, you know, <laughs> shitty deal right here. But like, do I take this money, you know, to keep give it up? Like, what's your advice on that? Oh, that's a hard one because, you know, we all want the money sometimes. <laughs> Being in the same, you know, on the other end as well. Um, my, like the biggest thing there is like to start early so that you do open up like those options in advance. Um, you don't want to be struggling to take whatever's given to you because it's pretty evident. If you come in and you pitch and you're just like begging, like you're, the terms are not necessarily going to be in your favor. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I always suggest that startups and founders is align yourselves both with, um, you know, you're networking with investors, but also network with experienced operators, even if they're not in your field, because they've already, you know, they've already raised rounds, they've already done these negotiations. And so, but if that comes across, I mean, there's a point where you have to say yes and move on, right? You can't continue to like drag your feet if your burn rate and you're about, you know, fail without the capital, but it's be smart about it. It's also be smart about the milestones is start tracking those milestones because you're able to see, okay, if, if I get $200,000, it'll get me to a point where I could start just continuing to generate revenue on my own. So I might not necessarily need a million. I might need somewhere between like three and 500,000. And so that's a little bit um, better for you is, you know, tracking like what that looks like. That's a good question. Like, I think a lot of founders have trouble knowing what to ask for, right? It's like, like you ask for everything you want, you know, all the people you want to pay salaries for all the, you know, tools, the software, the marketing gizmos, whatever, and go all out, you know, potentially scale even faster. Or you like do conserve, like, you know, only pay what you need. Right. I think there's a big disconnect on that. Right. Now, of course you gotta, you know, consider the fund, how much they're investing in stuff too. But I think a lot of people say, should I invest for like, you know, ask for $300,000 or 3 million. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of times they struggle with figuring that out. And I often see that with, with uh, founders who have not aligned themselves with other operators that they can kind of get feedback from, right? Because both your investor and likely your advisor is only going to know one portion of, of what you're 
of what you're pitching and working on, right? They might know the industry, they might know the stage. Um, generally, they're aligned by, you know, stage and, and the vertical. That's why you would go pitch them. Angels themselves, you know, they really like want to dive in and, and assist, right? But they might not know like what these milestones and how to capture the customers in the sense. And so, you know, there's a couple of things that you should have your shop in order. Obviously, you're legal. You need to, your accounting should always be, you know, uh, pretty laid. And then the next I would say is like these these milestones. So if you have a fractional um, CFO is is always good, uh, depending if you're growing um, someone in the industry that can kind of help determine what a, like an evaluation would be would be great. So how frustrating is for you? Like, because it's like most VC angels they have on the on the website. We invest in this or we don't invest this. Right, the 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 philosophy is pretty clear on there. Mm -hmm. But it's not found. I still like spray everyone. Right, you know, like if you're invested, you only invest in B to B. They'll get like emails or calls from people B to C or I only invest in <laughs> seed round. I'm a B round. Like how much frustrating? It has to be frustrating. Now we're thinking, you know, like you can't take the time to, to read my website and like what are you doing, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really interesting because you see folks that like deliberately do that because they're trying to make a relationship in advance. And then so it's it's hard to tell because if you're not following maybe like a very um, approachable email that kind of lays out your metrics, you really have to kind of dive into these pitch docs and figure out like where, where people are going. So it, it, it is, I would say, frustrating at that time, but also, you know, on the investment side, you're trying to build relationships too with with founders and so you obviously if it's in that particular industry you want to see that it's out there um so it's like this catch 22 i think so follow-up question like you you, you i've seen some vcs are like they're pretty much like never email me never cold email me never call call me <laughs> if there's no referral don't you know don't waste our time and other people i know were like you know i you know i'm looking for a deal flow if i just say no to everyone i won't have a deal flow so email me cold email whatever the case be what's your point of view on that it's really getting to know that particular investor, right? If there's somebody that, that really does not do cold email, then you don't want to kind of frustrate them. But the times have changed now, um, especially with COVID um, and also with diverse diversity, it's hard to get a warm referral. So most folks are really opening the, up the doors these days. So I would say if, you know, try the cold email, um, if it's aligned in your industry, if, if you can't get a warm introduction, um, know where they are socializing right so if uh you're following their social media you should know who they associate with on a constant basis right they're tagging them uh they're on panels with other folks and so there's a, a lot of ways i think right now is to prep yourself for future capture um everybody's visible online and so you can start to dive into those networks uh with you know your second and, and third relationship one thing that's funny too, I always hear founders like, you know, I, you know, I emailed, you know, such and such investor and they haven't replied yet. I'm like, okay, you serious right now? Like, I don't think some founders realize how many emails or, or contacts you'll get a day. Like, now don't give me an exact number. Can you give me a round part estimate? Like how many you get a week or a day that's unsolicited? It, it really depends. Like it's all platforms. It comes in different, you know, it could be a call. It, it could be, um, like emails, uh, obviously with the early stage in different companies and the time of year. So it could be hundreds, it could be some days are just less than that. Um, but in an annual basis, you'd imagine if you're calling and emailing somebody, somebody else, all the founders are doing yeah. that. So if someone's gonna cold email you, what, would they, what needs to be in the email so they can catch your eye? Is it a subject line, is it a certain word? Like what catches your eye from a code email? Like, man, let me let me look at this. So there's definitely uh, templates out there. So I like Hustle Fun and some other folks are um, very open to um, certain templates. Uh, obviously, hey, I'm working on this. It's aligned in so XYZ vertical. Um, you invest in early stage. I'm currently doing this revenue by XYZ. Um, I coming from this particular ecosystem. Um, I understand some of your other portfolio companies uh, fit almost the same bill. I'd love to have a conversation, right? Okay. Um, so you're trying to lay out what their investment thesis is. But that's always the best way I think is for a warm email to to work is that you've actually done the due diligence and like, okay, it's worth taking the call. It sounds like they know what I'm doing. They've researched me. 
Um, and so this call, the 30 minutes is not going to be a wasted time. Okay. So here's the next question. And this is like a pet peeve of mine, right? Just personal. So like you hear all the time, like we'll say there's two founders trying to get investment, right? One founder is brand new, but hasn't done anything yet. You know, mm -hmm. pretty good idea. has some traction. Other founder has failed two times, keeps on losing money, right? It's like investors will invest in the two time failed founder than the brand new founder. Why is that? Just because they learn lessons with other people's money. And, yeah. you know, like you didn't, you didn't, you didn't lose my money. You, 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 you lost my partner's money. So exactly. hopefully you lose some, you don't lose like a million dollar lessons. That's usually it. This thing doesn't pass logic to me though, you know? If, well, I mean, if, if you fail, but someone else's million, I'm sure one, you learn from it just from your own ego, mm -hmm. right? But two, um, along the way you've, kind of really grasp and tested yourself in your resilience. And so I think resilience is why folks tend to invest in folks who've already started something, right? It's kind of like their goal is to de-risk this investment. And so there's multiple ways to de-risk. And one of them is having been a founder and jumping through the hoops. But on the other hand, it really depends on the investor. If I am an operator investor and I understand the founder journey and I myself or someone on my team has, um, you know, one in this particular segment, then it's easier, yes, for them that you are like the right product, right fit versus someone who's, you know, who's, I don't know so well. Shady, can you explain the different... Um, uh, what's it called like different titles in a venture firm? Like the thing is analyst, junior associate, partner, junior partner, and how that all breaks down. So that is a very convoluted question. So um, why, why I say that it depends on like the size of the firm. Um, so you'd have to, those titles are used all across from large firms like Goldman Sachs um, all the way down to um, like smaller firms and accelerators. And so generally, you know, your general partner is the person who's leading the shop. They, they're they going out, they're fundraising themselves to, you know, wealthy investors or institutional banks. You know, I don't think most people realize that, right? Like the money, uh, invest, investors just have, have get a billion dollar fund, right? They have to go, you know, fundraise just like everyone else, right? Yeah, they definitely do. I mean, it just depends on the size of the fund and when, where you are. So if you're a first time fund, I mean, you are asking, you know, high net worth individuals, you know, 200,000 check here, 500,000 check here. You're asking someone to put in a million, someone to put in 2 million. It's the same thing. Oh, well, you haven't proven yourself out. So you're not going to get an investment from like CalStars or any of these retirement systems. So you are also like a founder is, is having to prove how you're going to return the same, the same money. Um, and so they are definitely taking meetings and like founders is they're trying to get as little meetings as, as they need to as well so yes um so talk talk about your role is it called SoGal? yeah SoGal. so that's a worldwide uh investment firm correct correct so SoGal is a global um firm and it's structured in two ways uh, so there's an investment arm SoGal ventures and so they have their own investment thesis as well and then um SoGal a global foundation as well is a support. And so that is a global network of diverse investors and entrepreneurs. And that allows the founder and investor community to have conversations that are not necessarily focused on strictly just investing, right? We understand that as diverse candidates. Um, and so when we, when, when that is said, like, so gal supports, um, First, it started with women, then now it's diverse founders. So that could be, you know, ethnic diversity, LGBTQ, it could be veteran. Um, and so it's the wide, even if you're a male, that fits that category. So, so how long has SoGal been around? So SoGal has been around since approximately like 2015, 2016 time range. Uh, it was actually homegrown first um, with the SoGal community out in California. And so the women, so Pocket Sun and Elizabeth Galba, who are the managing partners, they uh, first met um, in California at 500 Startups. And they realized really quickly that women 
one, weren't being invested in, and they were trying to figure out why. And so as they went to a lot of the investor meetings, they realized like they were the only woman in the room. And at that time, they were also really young, like they were like 25 and 26. And so when you imagine um, saying at that point, I'm going to start a fund, and you're not only a woman, and you haven't done the fund yet, but you also are, you know, like millennial, it's like, this is not going to happen. But they, they definitely pulled um, this off. It, uh, they're the first millennial um, investment firm. And so Pocket out of Asia is 30 under 30. Same thing with Elizabeth Galbert here in the States. So what, what's your role as an Austin State Elite for SoGal? What do you do? So here we launched uh, last year in 2019. Um, the intent there is to connect um, local founders, entrepreneurs, and investors, one together in the, in the local ecosystem, but also provide them a wider range of opportunity to connect with other chapters across the world. Um, what we know and what most folks know is that if you are in an ecosystem that's not in Silicon Valley or Boston, it's really hard to network and make relationships. But you also know that um, networking outside of your region, maybe your customer base is in a different region or chapter. Um, so that allows you to land or to start a developing relationships that you would, one, normally wouldn't have, but two, that you know that they are diverse friendly as well. So how has COVID affected the VC industry? You know, it's definitely changed a lot of things. Um, like we talked about, uh, people seem to be a lot more approachable. You know, you're not having to physically go to Sand Hill Road to try to woo somebody, you know. Um, I, I can take a call. I could take more calls in the day. So we see a lot of VCs, actually a lot more activity. Um, and we're definitely encouraging folks to start reaching out now. You know, I've done like quite a few Zoom pitches in the Bay Area now, mm -hmm. and they all admit, you know, if there's no COVID, we'd have made all of you fly in here and pitches in, all, in person, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a lot more deal flow potentially. Yeah, so and it, you know, what's really exciting is it's like frictionless, right? So let's just say I'm here in Texas and I want to pitch someone in California and pitch someone in Boston and then like in Miami, I can literally do that in a day if I wanted to. And before it's like you're limited by this, like the time constraints, you have to schedule a time, um, probably way in advance so that you can book your tickets. And so it's reduced the friction, which, like I said, for diverse founders, that's probably the most priceless thing at, at this point in time. Um, I mean, really, who has money like to fly from, you know, Austin to San Francisco, get a whole chair room, rent a car, take yeah. three or four days out to run your business? Like, yeah. So next question. When someone's pitching you, like suppose it is a pitch competition or one on one or where the case may be, how soon do you decide like, OK, this is like horrible. This is great. Or, like, is it 30 seconds, a minute? Like how soon the pitch do you like get a um, sense? OK, this might be worth my time or maybe not worth my time. You know, it, <laughs> I'd say it really depends on how the person's deck is set up uh, in the in the pitch and like how long it is. Right. So there's different time lengths depending on on like what stage you're pitching and like what the purpose of the pitch itself is um i'd say you know if it's a completely like cold one i mean you're going to be listening to the pitch and then and then diving in um, most pitch competitions you know they're somewhere between five and, and ten minutes and then you have your, your q a and so the goal there is to to really understand if someone's like full of shit <laughs> Right. So I think you can generally tell um, if they're tiptoeing around numbers, if they don't sound very confident about even about what they've put on the screen themselves. It's almost makes you want to question those things. And and like the most prepared founder would probably understand um, more of a deep dive in their business. And if they do, they'll generally um, showcase that for you. What's your take on solo founders and co-founders? When you say that. Like, do you, do you, do you, are you more apt to invest in a solo founder versus a co-founder? Do you think solo founders are more successful, not successful versus co-founders? It, it, it varies. There are some solo founders that are just very impressive. You know, they, they know their market. They've had domain experience. They also 
are like the CEO, right? If you are a person that you are not the show face and you're not like the one that can raise rounds, it's going to be a little bit harder for you. And so sometimes when that person goes at it alone, like things take a lot longer because they don't have, uh, they might have the product experience, but they don't have like the business experience. So in those cases, you definitely want to see a team built out. Um, especially like, for instance, if you're in healthcare, you always want to make sure that you have the right mix of folks on your team. So it's not just about, hey, I'm going to go get five people and let's co-found this, right? Because at that point, then it actually creates a little, a lot more friction because now you're going to need to add in more people and you've already filled your spots just with like placeholders. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really about being, you know, strategic. Uh, understanding your strengths, understanding what the industry expects. So if you need a clinical service, you know, um, a clinical officer, and you know, in order to do regulatory, you know, you'll have to have that person, then it behooves you is to try to find them a little earlier on. So anyway, change the subject. Next, let's talk about uh, Latinx investments, entrepreneurship, and your take on that. And how's that going in the world today? Is that again? Uh, Latinx investments entrepreneurship yeah so just i mean like you imagine um we're all ethnic we generally are pretty tied <laughs> hand in hand with each other right so when you're thinking like black and latinx um we see a lot of momentum right so latinx and vc um we see uh, a lot of the diverse funds first time fund emerging fund managers being started now um and if not now they're actually getting their their follow on round from from before. Um, so that is very important um, because it's about time. Um, as a global um, society, we understand that there is markets across the world that definitely would benefit from having a diverse um, companies, right? If you think about market capture and Latinam, uh, if you think about in Europe and in Africa, you know, those are huge markets that have been untapped. Um, so that's why when we say that there is um, power behind the numbers and power behind diversity, that's that's really what we're talking about is that um, we're a global organization. So for you to like keep yourself um, in like the pattern matched category, like Caucasian male doing Stanford, XYZ, you know, like the market that is a millionaire, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they are already, you know, analyzes like the, like the number of unicorns are kind of becoming less the way that the public markets are shaping up and all these different, you know, investment vehicles, it's definitely changing uh, the investment scene. And so those completely huge outsized returns, you know, you're going to have to start working now at it, right? Like, and finding markets that are untapped. So uh, like the example you use for the two uh, SoGal co-founders, you know, two young females, everyone is like probably a middle-aged man, mm -hmm. had to match the same with the Latinx founders, right? Or Latinx VCs, you know, probably the same demographic is correct? Yes. Um, we see a lot of women actually too in the Latinx VC space is kind of coming up. Um, and I think a lot of that, even like for myself as a Latin, as you know, as Puerto Rican woman, is I've always set out to, you know, compete with the guys. I've always, you know, I want to show that it's not because I'm not talented enough. It's just because I have never had access to it. If you give me access, like I'll execute. That's always been, I think for most diverse folks is you give me access. And once I learn the rules of the game, I can execute. But until then, how am I supposed to showcase that so for that is that the responsibility of let's say uh let's say the caucasian uh vc fund you know to go out and you know recruit and like and teach you know other people the name the game or is the responsibility of the of the non-caucasian people come in and, and learn the game i'd say it's a little bit of both right so for the longest time i think it's been the flip side it's like diverse founders and uh, fund managers are really trying to gain the experience and credibility to open those doors. Um, but what we see is that it's always been like locked up, right? Like the knowledge and the access. All the unwritten rules and stuff like that. Correct, correct. I mean, if you if you write the rules yourself, like obviously no one can get into whatever world that you've created. 
And so in this case, we need those champions and we have a lot of those champions. Like, like, like Ben Horowitz is an amazing um, diverse founder advocate um, and diverse investor advocate. And so I'd say like in the industry, he's, he's one of the big players is really um, helping to move a lot of the conversation forward. So who are some diverse um, VCs that you, that you look up to, or you look to as mentors? Um, let's see. Oh, that's so good. Okay. Let's see. So obviously the girls at SoGal, um, very respected. Um, Arlen Hamilton. Um, so I met her about a year and a half ago. Yeah, She has a great story. Great story. Uh, like my upbringing, I don't come from money. Um, definitely not. <laughs> And so I've been ground, grinding it out first for such a long time. And so I was almost ready to give up in the VC lane just because I was like, I'm from Texas. I'm from Austin. Like, I'm going to have to move to Silicon Valley to make this happen um, because a lot of the opportunities are far and few between. And then obviously we know when I met her and you can tell that she started this fund um, and she's doing amazing things for the founders. Uh, she's very founder centric and also bringing in a lot of diverse investors. Um, it was like a champion, um, like watching her, her do that, right? And so for myself, I was like, you know what? Like, this is what I set out to do. Like, this is why I even started the journey. And so I'm gonna kind of keep, I'm gonna keep at it. So if you're a founder, what are some warning signs that, okay, this investor is like, maybe not for me, or maybe this investor is like, maybe try to scam me or take advantage of me or not the right for it for me. What does this have some red flags they should be looking, the founders should be looking for? Yes. So I would say an investor who is just overly aggressive um, and really trying, you know, whether it's the terms that they're offering, um, if you find something in the deal terms that really just is like, catches you off guard, you know, you definitely want to, to be mindful of that, but especially if they're really not in, in your industry and they just want to be a part of it. Um, it's like, okay, you're going to give me all this money. It's really interesting to see when some investors do that because they're looking just to like, to take a chunk of the business, right? They're not providing any um, value add to you. They probably are going to be all up in your business and they want to be at weekly meetings. And like, that's the type of investor that you don't want yeah. on your cap table. Like, like you want to be my weekly stand up every day. Like what's it? No, <laughs> correct. Correct. And so that's why it's, it's, you need to be able to pick up. You need to also have enough investor meetings is to know what that looks like. And, um, often you can, you know, even ask portfolio companies as a reference, Hey, who's, who's made it, who didn't make it. Like if you failed, you were invested with them. Hey, why, why did you fail with this particular investor? Oh, it was us. Our, our team broke up or, you know, um, they promised a certain type of support and they didn't give it to me. Like, that's also really good to know, even if it is a, um, more respected firm as well. So let's go back to your background again and talk about your experience with the, with the U S military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, my family has been in the, the military for generations. So obviously, since, you know, Puerto Rico, you know, World um, the World War, like, basically, my uncle and great uncles were in it, um, and my family itself. Um, and then so for myself, I was also a DOD, like an installation management um, consultant there. So when we're doing a joint base merger, that's in Alaska, right? That was in Alaska. And so we were merging the two bases, the Army and the Air Force base there as well. And so I... And then also your military spouse. Correct. So pretty early on after my undergrad, um, became military spouse, kind of did those, those travels. <laughs> so immediately was straight to Alaska, the most rural place I think that you could be. <laughs> um, but it was really exciting because um, there is a stat that says that most people don't leave like... I think it's like a 30 mile radius yeah. of their house, right? Um, their whole life. And so it's really interesting because when you go to Alaska, like we drove there. So it was like 5,000 miles of just pure, um, just wilderness. Like, yeah. <laughs> wilderness, no bears. <laughs> but uh, they, you know, um, it's one of the most uh, diverse places, 
actually in, in America, most people wouldn't know that. Uh, I had did some consultant work for the school district there in the career tech and education um, and some future of work initiatives for the state. And just in order there, it's the most diverse school district in the nation. So if they speak 66 languages amongst all of the different schools in the high school, um, and you're talking about like native Eskimo um, tribes, native Indians, uh, Russian, you know, Laotian, like anything like Costa Rica. I have, there was everybody there. It was just really impressive to see. And so you got involved in the tech startup VC things while you were a military spouse? Yes. And talk about the challenges of that, you know, because I don't think people realize the challenge of military spouses. Because I think the stats are like military spouses, like 20% unemployed, 40% underemployed, mm -hmm. most have college degrees, but you know, they got to move every two years as so a challenge to, you know, do anything, right? So how did you work through that? So for me, um, it was really hard to find an entrepreneurship ecosystems while I was like moving, right? It really took a lot of effort and work. Um, so for instance, in Alaska itself, um, the first place was the, you know, obviously the schools are going to start providing their entrepreneurship ecosystem. And so I was on advisory board there and, um, I started seeing the development of like pitch competitions, but they have a very different set of innovation in Alaska, right? Um, so you imagine a lot more practical innovation. Like if I'm driving a truck and you have um, tracks, snow tires, they snap to your truck and then you can drive across frozen lakes and rivers. Um, or they have a lot of small planes. So there's a lot of different type of innovation that comes there. And so one of my friends is actually... Um, he had developed a like marine steel grade uh, jet ski that can literally um, slam into anything and the hole would not bust. It's called a Luma ski. And that was the, that was kind of part of the journey where I really realized is like, I know how hard he struggled to find investment. He also had those investors that actually tried to take a lot of the business away from him because he, he was not, um, this is first time founder. So that's where I first started saying, you know what, I need to be an advocate for this and also an advocate for folks that are not uh, connected to ecosystems. Cause it was so challenging one for myself, but also for him. So then from Alaska, I, uh, we moved to the Raleigh Durham area. Um, and so there was a different type of tech system, right? The uh, research, Angle Research Park, you have a lot of health because of uh, NC State and Chapel Hill and Duke, um, but you also had a lot of like manufacturing and um, enterprise tech. So that's literally on that side of the world is when I started running into like DARPA and a lot of the defense innovation because Fort Bragg is, is, is on that side as well. Um, so I made it a point for myself is to be involved and engaged with you know, the accelerators and the investors that are on the East Coast. I traveled up, to, you know, like uh, to New York and other places just so that I can get a feel um, of what some of the, the challenges were, but also like what some of the wins were, right? So there's different setups to move innovation forward in these non-Silicon Valley ecosystems. So this time, you know, your husband, he's like, what are you doing? Like, are you just, are you like playing games? This is a hobby. Like, uh, what are you doing right now? Of course, how that work come about? <laughs> You know, it's really interesting because it's he completely, it was not like aware of any of this that was going on, right? So I'm over here at like demo days and like 3D printing and like 3D. Um, he was like, well, you're going out partying like, again? Like 3D bones. Yeah, because I would drive an hour and a half to be. You're not, you're not to network and partying. <laughs> what are you doing, right? Yeah. But he always knows me to be like diving in and engaged. And so it was, that's always the lifestyle. And like, I think that's something also about being like a resilient and a military spouse is like, we don't need to be, we're pretty independent, right? We don't need a husband there. We can go for long times um, engaged in kind of like our own like career field. And so I see that as an added benefit. So being a you know, military spouse, you know, the, the DOD experience, how has that helped you or not helped you in your, your role right now? So currently, here in Austin um, and across Texas and a couple of other markets like Las Vegas and um, San Diego and some other places, 
you know, Defense Innovation, um, Army Futures Command, and a lot of those folks are, have now moved here to Austin. And so that experience um, and dealing with deep tech, like AI, machine learning, um, really understanding like how a government um, both acquires technology and also how they implement it it's been very beneficial, I think, for some of those conversations. Um, we know, obviously, with COVID, like healthcare, and um, a lot of large organizations are going to be like changing their structures. And so that's experience that a lot of people don't have, you know. So what's your take on this, you know, this, and this is my opinion again, like, it's like a lot of military spouses are like, oh, will be me. You know, my husband's deploying, I got to take care of the kids. I want a job, but there's nothing out there for me. So I'll just, you know, stay at home. And there's other, you know, spouses like you, like, you know, make stuff happen, right? Why, why are some spouses like you make stuff happen? Other spouses like pretty much like, you know, or resign to their fate and don't try to get better. You know, I say it's always a personality trait. Like I've always been this person. My dad, you know, is from Brooklyn. And so I was raised to be this type of person, very go-getter. I don't care what you say. Like, I'm going to sit at the table, even if you don't want me there, like I'm going to hold my own. And so I say that that transpired into being able to utilize um, like those different moves in, in a certain way. Um, and then the other part is also, um, you have to see it to believe it. And so a lot of times you don't know what is available to you or not. Um, when I got to Alaska and to North Carolina, I would be lying to say that I wasn't depressed. Uh, it was like getting rejected. It was the same thing going there. No one knows you. Why am I going to hire you? And like no one in the whole freaking state knows who you are. Like they can't vouch for you. Right. And so I would say it took me like five months to find a role not because I wasn't qualified. It's just because I hadn't built those networks. And it's like, well, why are you, why did you move? And like, oh, you're your military spouse. Well, that means you're going to leave in two years. Like, why do I even want to hire you then? So it's and like, that's, that's a pet peeve me too. Like, so you, you were to go with no one in a row and instead of taking on a potential superstar for six months, right? A year, right? Mm -hmm. I never understood that logic. I, you know, and I don't understand that either. Cause literally like two, like anyone that you would call in my past would say like the solid track record like I took on a like a one-year project like slam dunk like they wanted me to fly to these remote regions in Alaska to do work and I was like I'm sorry like I, I have to leave right and so I think folks don't realize that you know one um high, highly capable you know whether you're a woman or a male right because you could be a male spouse too um and two it's like hey you should because you're going to get someone that comes in and usually military spouses are very frank, right? Um, hey, this is not working out. So-and-so, she is not adding to the game. At some point, she probably needs to get fired. Like, <laughs> so you actually have someone with outside eyes come in for a year And you or think two. too, like, like, you, like you went to Alaska, someone thought, okay, Shady did a move to her whole household from this place to Alaska. And that's not, you know, this doesn't happen, right? That's a lot of planning, logistics, figuring stuff out. Guess that alone, she'd be like, a, you know, okay, let me take a look at what she's doing. Exactly. I mean, you're handling it all, like finances and, uh, you know, move to move, being a landlord from afar. Like, these women are pretty on their game, I'd say. So next, talk about your role with, I think it's called Lift Fund in, in San Antonio. Uh, what's your role with that? What you, what's that about? Yeah, so uh, I have been involved with Lift Fund since I was in San Antonio. So I used to work for the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. And, you know, basically it's a long name, but <laughs> what that means is there are um, community development finance institutions and microfinance and economic development agencies all across the U.S. And so what we did is uh, we were an advocate for these different institutions. And when I say that, it's basically like a collaborative. And so anything that was um, needed like policy or investment, we would um, align everyone towards these specific goals, right? And so Lift Fund, you should be Axion Texas. 
um, which was a very dynamic organization. And um, Jane Barrera was on our board of directors. And so that longstanding relationship really led to understand that as a nonprofit, um, they're able to assist a lot of the founders in different ways than traditional lending can assist. Um, and so for veterans, uh, for women veterans and military and the connected community, um, that's really important is because you often don't know how to trust folks when you're building out your company because you don't, you have never like stepped into that world before. And so um, currently I work with them to assist in aligning some of those initiatives um, so that one, they can be and better serve the military community, um, but as well as other diverse founders as well. So from your point of view, what are some characteristics of successful founders and characteristics of unsuccessful founders? Mm. So a, a lot of successful founders are definitely coachable. Um, I hear that all the time, yeah. It's absolutely like, if you can uh, like take an advice, kind of filter it out and able to act on it, like you're, you'll be more successful than someone who thinks that they know it all. Uh, because the the notion is that you will pivot at least five times in your business, in your team, in your needs, and what the market wants, like who the customer is. And so if you're literally like stuck in your way and you're, 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 you won't make it, you have to have like a resilient like mind and, and mindset to be able to, to understand um, that you don't know it all, right? <laughs> Yeah. So, and what are founders, what do most founders get wrong about the fundraising process? I think that founders uh, sometimes tend to be so in love with their product that they don't realize like that there's competition, you know, and they think that it's going to come easy or that the money is free flowing. Um, they might see other people, you know, get funding and just feel like, oh, this is going to be really easy. And then and, and it's really not. Um, it is uh, strategic. The other part I also see is they also think that they need this money in order to make their company work, which is also not true and not a good uh, representation. Some folks can um, get away with actually bolstering up their team, their sales team, maybe doing contract sales to get the revenue flowing instead of actually having the investment. And so that way they actually get more traction and they figure some things out. Um, they actually get a bigger slice of the pie. Uh, that's why I particularly enjoy a lot of uh, military connected community founders is because they will actually have a lot more revenue. Uh, they will be a lot further along um, in their company before they actually go out and raise. And so at that point, they're looking to raise because they actually like need it um, versus just like want it. Um, and so, so we always say that sales is, you know, is the best type of like traction and, and funding. Yes. So next, um, on June 18, 2020, you were, I believe, awarded a, a scholarship from the 100 Women in Finance in the CII Association. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, that's really exciting. So 100 Women in Finance is a global organization of investors and uh, it's a pretty big deal, right? It's it's a it's great organization. Um, their their mission there is to actually promote women um, at all different stages. So CAIA is at the Association for uh, Chartered An Analysts for Alternative Investments. So Alternative investments is the asset classes of like of real estate, like private equity, um, like venture capital and hedge funds. And so those are often the most unrepresented as well in the investment ecosystem. So they selected uh, 20 women globally to be a part of the program. And Do you know how many people like applied or like nominated for it? I don't know how many people were nominated or applied, um, but what they see in the candidate is someone that um, will be able to change the industry, um, but also wasn't privy before to access to that particular industry. Um, so it's a lot of like developing the person, right? So when I when I dive into all of the alternative investments, like 
Um, VC is an asset class. And since I have like real estate and property, I understand real estate and property, but like hedge funds and like, I don't even know like half of what some of that stuff is. Um, but a lot of times you need to be thrown in and have that support in order for you to grow into a person that a firm might need. And so for me, this is just an extremely perfect opportunity to be surrounded by so many like powerful women, um, especially um, all across the world. Like I'm enjoying it. So back in 2019, you were part of an organizing community for something called the Latinx Summit. Yeah. Now, was that, was that done in 2022 or was it canceled because of COVID? Uh, for 2022, they actually did, they, they did it virtual. Okay. So they actually grew it. So we had did it in person. It was with a LULAC, which is a long stay Latino uh, advocacy and civil rights group. Mm -hmm. And so they had did it small. And then this year they hosted a pitch competition to go along with it. So and last year, is, this is a San Antonio that this is done at or? Yeah, so last year, uh, well, one was in San Antonio, and then one was in Austin, and this year it was supposed to be on site in DC. Um, so they generally have very renowned folks like from the SBA and, um, you know, vice president, president shows up. Um, but this year, so this is like a, a like a summit, team. pit people pitch in like, a, just a basic tech summit. No, in, in this case, it's it's a little bit different. Okay. It's it's a little bit more focused on um, first time founder and um, progression of that particular founder. So the goal there is to, well, like we said, is is if you can see it, you can believe it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's give a platform to outstanding Latinos who have built companies, uh, investment firms. Um, on the panels and everything is so folks can see, oh my gosh, like in one generation, she was able to do that. Like, okay, I shouldn't be li limiting to myself um, to, you know, smaller goals. So what's some of your personal goals moving forward? Like, do you want to like, you know, start your own VC firm? Do you want to be, you know, general partner at, you know, Sequoia Capital? Like what's your personal goals and professional goals moving forward? I, you know, those, those are interesting. <laughs> So originally I had set out to work for a larger firm. Um, I quickly realized that I not in the pattern match for that, right? So when I say that, a lot of VCs, um, a lot of folks were pulled, you know, in their undergrad, right out of undergrad to be like an analyst or an associate. And then you kind of move through the the ranks and then you go to like Morgan Stanley and you become like an associate first for however many years and then you come back and then you do your MBA. And so I came in at this like at all different angles, right? So I came in and I did my master's and I had um, some of the other pattern match things. Like I had never been at Morgan Stanley for, for an extensive amount of time. So for me, um, that's why I said when seeing Arlen, like I really was like this particular like starting a firm is something that I'm going to do. And so recently I was at Stanford and 500 startups in a, in an invite only uh, cohort um, centered around diverse founders and creating new funds. So I've started in that path, uh, but obviously, as you know, is that you have to raise your fund yourself. Um, and so that does take some time. So there's a two to three year mark um, that I've set particularly for that. Um, so in the meantime, I will be looking for like a larger firm to. So for. what makes someone a successful investor is like, you know, have to have like so many home runs, so many doubles, like 10% success rate. Is there a metric out there that says, okay, this investor is, is actually a successful investor? First and foremost, I'd say whatever you've laid out um, in your fund and like the return that you're going to give to your LPs, like that's always the best metric for that uh, you've you've outlined what you think that you're capable of in this market um because different industries have different returns you know if and um different markets so uh, obviously the big firms like sequoia and um some of the others they get so much of the best deal flow right and so those metrics for vcs like like change you know whether it's you know industries like 3x 5x it, it really just depends. Um, and so I think it's, it's hard to say 
like what makes the best investor. So of course, you know, you know, the Bay Area, you know, Austin, Seattle, Boston, New York, you know, like known as like the you know, you know, VC hubs, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're a founder in, I don't know, um, Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, I love barbecue there. Yeah, Memphis, like, right? I'm, I'm sure there's investors there, you know, and angels and stuff, but how do you like, what do you do? Like, I mean, you can't fly to the Bay Area every week to you know, pitch people. Like, mm -hmm. how do you even get started? So generally, like your local um, ecosystem will have players who have stepped out or um, founders in the region. So I always like to look at things like a region. Like, so for Texas, like we're in the mighty middle, right? That's a term. You can look it up. Um, <laughs> and it's everything from like Texas to Illinois and down this whole particular area. And so the, the reason sometimes that they lay those out is because a lot of the same challenges in that particular region. So the Midwest is going to be the same. Um, it, you would want to reach out to those particular uh, folks and understand kind of like some of their networks. Um, and that way they can like uh, generally, like for instance, let's say you are in Memphis. Um, it's probably a lot of like the earlier stage. So you'll have your early stage rounds. They're really great in doing that. And then after you get to a certain round, there generally is a fund or a, some type of network that might syndicate um, and like be able to access like a fund on some of the coast in order to progress you through the different rounds. So as you get bigger checks, generally the coast have more of the big checks. Um, and so then you'll have to kind of align yourselves with that. So Shady, you know, obviously you're on the grind, you're doing big things, you're a superstar, you're involved with a whole lot, a lot of things. <laughs> what, what do you do for fun? Oh, I do everything. Oh man, I do it all. Um, hike, snowboard, um, work on cars. Like, I don't know. I just play football. I don't know. <laughs> so kind of like a, a tomboy. I'm a different type of girl. Yeah. <laughs> Watch sports. Um, yeah, I, I, I like to be, um, I like culture a lot. So you'll, you'll see that I've traveled like to Shanghai and Tokyo. And when we're not in COVID, I probably would have been taking like every six months I actually like to try to go to a different ecosystem um, because I feel like learning the local environment is is a little bit better than you know than just visiting for a week or so no no you're, you're pretty busy like a lot of people are like how do you do your schedule like do you wake up one day and just wing it do you have a plan like how do you prioritize all the things that you got going on how do you do that you know I'm actually a big winger and it's not good. <laughs> um, generally, I'd like to, you know, you map out like, like everyone else does is like their weeks. Um, also blocking time off on the schedule um, so that you have your personal like downtime. Um, and so for me, um, that fluctuates. I try to like block that off in advance. So if it's like every Friday, I just don't book anything in, in the mornings from a certain time in case I need to. Um, like have some me time, then I do that. Um, and so a lot of like tech implementations, it's really important. And, and speaking of wellness, how do you take care of yourself to make sure you get, you know, get burned out and you know? Um, I have a good, so that's something about me is I'm pretty uh, like down to earth and like no BS. And so I surround myself with folks that are the same. Um, I try to have individuals that I can relate to from a more of, of my background perspective, right? So obviously growing up and having, you know, like a lot of challenges and having to work through things, I still have friends like all across the US, like I'll call them and they might be, you know, higher places than me. I'm like, hey man, like, what's up? Like, how's it going? You know, like trying to just um, kind of going back to my roots. Cause you know, most people that are diverse um, that I know have, also um, been on the grind for a while and so it's refreshing to kind of just be normal for once and so that's what I generally like to do so you, you like say you've done a lot of traveling what's been your favorite place so far oh, my favorite place mm. I actually really enjoyed Shanghai um, so when you think about China you have so many um, preconceived ideas about what China is. 
And when you get there and then you, you picture New York and then you picture it like seven times better than New York. And, you know, <laughs> folks were driving around with their like Maseratis and stuff and like parking at like a dive bar and then they don't care if it gets dinged and stuff. So it, it was just really impressive to see, you know, they have both their cultural and then like, you know, huge skyscrapers and they may have built this whole entire area in like two years and all these skyscrapers. And I'm like, man, we can't even get like 35 built. Like what's going on? <laughs> you know, you have bullet trains, you know, they all underground, like the way that they can move and move people. And it's just really impressive uh, for me to have seen not having been to Asia before. And so I was there for a week and I don't know, it, it was really interesting just to know that you know, like in the US, we have a lot of freedom, but also there's some a lot of advanced tech in other places across the world. What's the most random place you've been to? Like you've been this place, people are like you went where? Like, why would you even <laughs> go here? Like, are, are, you, are you kidding me right? Why you pick this place to go to? So I went to a place, I didn't necessarily pick it. So I, I had flown to um, Spain and we were on the west side of Spain. And so we just started driving and then we ended up at these, um, like a border gates. I'm like, where are we? Like, we didn't even know. And we were literally at the Gibraltar, like the rock of Gibraltar. Okay. Right. And so we're like, what? So we like show our passports because we already had them. And we go in and, you know, I had never really even thought about going to Gibraltar. And so it's actually run by the British. So it's under British rule. So like fish and chips and everyone's speaking English, like proper English. And we'd literally just been in Spain, you know, and everyone's speaking Spanish. And so it was just the weirdest thing. And so we had, we got there uh, pretty late at night. Cause like I said, we were just wandering. And uh, so we get to the rock of Gibraltar. It's supposed to be closed, but then when we get there, the gate opens. And so we literally could go up there. And so we were able to see like, um, like Africa, we could see all of those different regions like lit up at night. And so that was the most random, um, and kind of pretty cool place to go to. So next, talk about the tech startup scene in Texas. You know, can you break down San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and Houston? Mm -hmm. So this particular, so Texas, if you don't know, um, the whole ecosystem is the 10th, one of the, it's like the 10th largest economy, right? Um, and so what we see there is different parts of Texas offer different things. So Houston has a lot of our fortune, you know, um, 500s, 100s there, and they uh, have an amazing like healthcare tech scene. Um, and then you obviously have oil and gas and energy um, centered in that area. And then Dallas has a lot of like corporate um, agencies and customers and, and money in itself. And so Dallas is pretty progressive as well. Um, in San Antonio, um, like, like CPG, um, and a lot of like your cybersecurity um, companies are definitely coming out of that region. And then Austin is almost like the tie-in here because we have, you know, University of Texas at Austin, as well as like St. Edwards and some other institutions. And so they've actively been working at the ecosystem for the last 20 years. So when people see Austin growing, it's not that it just happened to grow. It's like, they've been very deliberate deliberate um so uh like with like michael dell obviously was a ut grad and um, they stayed in the region building their companies and so you know with like what silicon valley experience is that's what we're trying to do in texas is actually connect all of the regions and what folks don't know is that you can actually drive to a lot of these ecosystems within you know one hour two hours or three hours, right? So in two hours, I can get to Houston, hour to San Antonio um, and get to Dallas as well. But Austin is definitely the lead, so to speak, in the state of Texas. Yeah, Austin is, I'd say Austin is like the champion for the region, right? So right now, um, a lot of the players here are really driving um, this access to different cities and trying to connect us all um, so that we can have that same um, like access to resources and access to, uh, you know, founders as some of the other regions have already. Yeah. And people not from Texas or this area, I don't think they realize how many colleges are here in Austin, San Antonio, like UC Austin, Baylor, 
mm -hmm. in San Antonio, UTSA, Trinity, Texas A&M around the road, you know, there's so many, you know, Texas State, you know, so many college and talent in this area. I don't think people realize the talent here. No, they definitely don't, but they're, they're picking up, you know, when you're having a young talent um, and they need an ecosystem that they can actually grow into, you know, the find relationships, get married, like Austin is, is very friendly um, in that sense. And it's also driving like the amount of people that move here. I think when I moved here about five years ago, we were getting like a hundred people a day moving here. Now it's like probably like 200, 250. I don't know. I see just everyone coming here. Um, and so that's nice. I mean, we like Oracle, like Google's building a second tower, you know, we have Facebook. And so that momentum is, is really driving a lot of the change um, here. Um, and then we also see that, for instance, um, like between Houston and Dallas, they're considering a, a bullet train. I think it might have been approved already. Um, but then you also see like, you know, Tesla's coming here. Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan came here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of folks that actually come through. Uh, we're a big presence too, like in the presidential sphere. So they come here. For so next, South talk about Southwest. your role with the thing is called Giddy Inc. Yeah. So Giddy Inc. Um, is a platform that works with uh, portfolio companies. So for instance, if a uh, company has already been invested in, um, they need to build out their team. And so they're looking for extreme like culture fit, um, productivity. And so we work with those portfolio companies to help them uh, map out and build a particular team. Um, that also might look like if an exec like from Twitter um, is leaving their company and wants to start a new company, then they would come to Giddy and assist in like tech dev is like the specialty there is finding the dev talent. So if you're looking for someone who graduated from the top school in India, they came and worked at a top agency in the US, they have this particular culture, you're needing someone that um, maybe has a background um, like from Snapchat, but also has other skill sets. It's being really mindful because at that point in time, the investor has put money in, and then now you're you're needing to like grow and and grow fast. And so that's one of the um, custom type services that we do. Uh, the other is also connecting um, just startups in themselves is finding dev talent um, of extremely high quality that's not in the U.S. as well. Can you talk about how hard it is? Like, for example, for me, I'm in Seattle, I have a startup. And people say, oh, oh you, you know, all the software developers out there, easy to find. Right? Well, actually, it's not because Amazon pays them $10 million a year, Microsoft, you know. Mm -hmm. And you have people from the Code Academy, so, you know, like, really don't know much about tech, right? They're just, like, you know, kindergarten level. Yeah. Can you talk about the challenges of, like, finding software developers for your tech company? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it's one of the hardest things, I think, out there. Um, most people would tell you that it, there is no science to it. Um, but what is really important is to know what you need and like what, how, how you're going to get there. Um, like don't cut corners, you know, with your, with your tech dev. And so, um, you know, like your stacks, you, if, if, if it's a CTO that you need and someone with the lifeblood and the culture understanding that's going to grow with you, it's really important to identify that earlier on uh, before you start spending like a ton of, of money on your yeah. dev, right? Because this person's going to need to um, be a good culture fit and you don't want to waste a lot of money before you find, to find that. Um, but also like you can get dev quality dev, um, outside of your particular region, right? If, if, if you outsource it. Um, yes. So for VCs, is it like some kind of certification test you got to take to be a VC? Do you have to have a certain amount of money? So some kind of ethical test you got to do or standards you got to follow? Or does anyone can say, I raised a $10 million fund, I'm, I'm a VC now. How does that work? Well, but folks don't just like, like raise, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you generally, in order to raise, you'd have to have uh, some type of credibility, I guess, if you had 10 million of your own, you know, um, but yeah, th there are standards. And so like the way that you progress and the skill sets that you learn um, at different firms, you know, you're, you're, you're building uh, out like, like your team. Um, 
but we have like VCs that are from um, different backgrounds, right? So they could be operators, they could be just first time fund managers, they can be investment makers that turned VCs. And that's because they're able to, to raise uh, that particular fund itself. But uh, like the SEC, the SEC really guides um, like all of the limited partners and like the way that they can invest and like how those relationships need to be established in advance. So there are some, a lot of like a back end rules. You just can't start like giving money, you know, e even as an angel investor, right? So um, there's ways that you can invest like crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been, um, there's certain asset that you need to have. And so those guidelines are pretty much set in stone by SEC. And then, so even like as you progress in angel investing in VC, you'd want to know what those are. So let's talk about angel investing a little bit. What's the difference between that and VCs? Angel investors are more like real, real early. They, they get smaller checks, right? You know, um, actually, I wouldn't determine it by check size. I would just determine it by the, the capability of that particular angel. Um, and generally, you see that they might be smaller check size than VCs because VCs like to write like bigger checks um, for less for a smaller portfolio. Angels, uh, they call them that because it's their money, right? They call the shots on how they want to give it um, and how they want to invest. So maybe they like you, maybe they want to give you a million dollars, maybe they want to give you a hundred thousand, a fifty, whatever that relationship is. The only person that they have to report to is themselves mm -hmm. and their checkbook, right? And so, it's like, if you go to Silicon Valley, like the check size might be bigger. It might be someone that is a Googler, you know. And so, when they invest, they're going to invest big. Um, and then you could be just a high net worth individual and you've said that you want to give out like smaller checks. So that's the angel. And then VC, it's like you are a actual like fund and your shareholders are your limited partners. So you've already set in stone in advance of raising this money, like you're going to return this money. So if you think about like uh, your 401k or whatever it might be, like the goal is to return that money to them first, and then you get your allotment after that. So that's, that's the difference. So now you have to be more, you have to say no more often because you're tied to uh, like rules and regulations. So next, this is like a several part question. Talk about how valuation is and how that works. And example, and then go into like, you know, I think in the barrier, you might get a country evaluated at 10 million. Mm -hmm. That same country would evaluate at maybe 7 million Austin maybe six in New York City. How does that all work and play? So generally, valuations, it just really depends on the ecosystem, right? And uh, the risk aversion there. So anything outside of the coast is going to be a little bit more risk adverse. They're going to want to have you more traction. They're going to not want to like have the valuation like really exceed because obviously when you go for the next round of funding, you don't want a down round, which basically means, you know, that you haven't like kind of met the original the metrics, right? Um, when you, when you're thinking about like the Bay itself, they have generally have a lot of unicorns, right? And so they ha also have the capability of growing companies potentially uh, a lot faster. And so they're a little bit more loose kind of, I think, with the valuations, but also when you think about like statistics in general, like people who have extremely high growth companies are all flocking there. So it looks like they're giving money away like left and right. It's just that it has been the long stay for so long is like they have so many unicorns It's because the deal flow is going there, right? At top of mind, if you have the next Google or Facebook, your immediate mind is to go to the Bay and find somebody there. And so with, with that in mind is like, they also want outsized returns, right? They're, com they're competing amongst their guy, you know, like all the folks there. So they're trying to, um, to, to put money out and to grow you faster. And so that's why you see the differences um, here, you like in the Midwest and other places, um, or Southwest, you'll have maybe like executives or a high net worth individuals that are not really um, looking to kind of freely throw money around. 
Shady, talk about the importance of founders. The founders really knowing in depth the details of the cap table. How important is like no control of the cap table? I think it's like you should definitely keep tabs if you don't know like cap table and um, how that's going to impact you in the future. Like slicing the pie, like early on, you can kind of see how you're going to be diluted. Um, also, know what your investment um, roadmap looks like. Uh, you know, investors really don't want you to mess up your cap table too much. And what that means is like whatever investor invests now, like the next investor is going to have to deal with them or whatever it is in the later rounds as you move forward. Um, and so you really want to understand what that looks like for you. You know, some founders are like, hey, everybody like gets the same percentage. Everyone's going to get 30%. We got three founders or, or whatnot. Um, but you have to be mindful. Like if you have a high growth company is like, you're going to need to set, you know, like your employee stock options and know that, okay, if I'm going to get a, an amazing CEO to come in to take my spot, once, once I'm not able to grow this company more, I'm going to need to offer him a certain amount of shares. So it's really important. I, I think early on is to, to really understand those dynamics. Like map everything out like five, 10 years down the road. Like yeah. Yeah. I mean, or at least, at least the, you know, five years, three to five, five years. years is because your company's going to change a lot. But if you understand it, you won't necessarily make a lot of uh, the mistakes. You know, you don't need to understand everything. You just need to understand where people have like royally screwed up and like try not to step into those lanes. So I think there is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, those convertible, con no, convertible notes, safes, and just regular equity. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference for those three? You kind of like do a good deal, do a quick explanation each one yeah so um <clears throat> so convertible notes has generally been the standard so a convertible note is basically i don't know what your valuation is at the current time um we both don't know we know that it's going to grow we don't know how much um so at this point in time we're going to set that we're we're investing this amount and like the cap, right? So you're, you're having uh, the cap that's there. And so when it does come to uh, fruition on the next round, like that's where you'll get like your evaluation. Um, so that's generally been safe for the investor and the founder um, and without having to give an early evaluation because you'll probably pivot and do a lot of changes and um, it kind of helps, you know, like that particular stage. The safe was, you know, recently been instituted. That's definitely founder friendly just because it's, it's a little bit more open-ended. Um, but sometimes that has been like misutilized by founders. And so there are some investors that have gotten screwed over, right? And so folks are starting to kind of like step back away from the safe um, back into like the convertible note. And that really, like I said, just depends on the different um, what you call it on the ecosystem and, and maybe the, the, the lane that you're in as far as uh, your vertical or market. So tell me about being paranoid, right? So let's suppose a convertible note, suppose you invest in my company and you give me a hundred thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And, but let's suppose my company doesn't do good and I can't raise another round that that turns into debt and I have to pay you a hundred thousand dollars, right? I know everyone says that never happens, but does it ever happen where it converts to debt and the founder has to pay the money back? I just say whatever term, you know, folks set up their terms very mm. differently, um, especially with the notes, like mm. the convertible note size. Um, so that's just kind of an individual, I think, one on one basis on, on how, how that would work. You know, um, obviously, like VCs, when when they're mapping out their portfolios, mm. like they are already understanding that nearly two thirds of their entire all the portfolios will like go to zero. And then so they only have like a third that's going to have outsized returns, right? So these these companies that they pick need to be able to return all of the failed mm -hmm. money as well. Okay. So that's why they're so particular um, when they are investing. Um, and then for founders themselves, it's really important to know what, like in the life cycle too of, of the fund, right? So generally when they get the money, they're trying to deploy it within the first three years or so. Um, and so if you miss the mark or if, if you're at the tail end of their fund and they haven't necessarily found the one, 
you know, that's a reason that they could be saying no to is like, they have already kind of taken their bets and they're really trying to round out what the returns might look like. Yeah, this is like a risk you take as a founder doing kind of a note. Like you don't raise a fund and you know, you owe this invest hundred thousand dollars. Are they gonna say, no, I want my money now. I know, I know, yeah. I know I hear it never <laughs> happens, you know, but it's just like. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't speak for most. And I, like I said, I guess it depends on the type of investor that you are setting this up with and then like the individual arrangements that they might be. Protecting. So don't give any names, any details, but this is a company out there you're talking to right now that you're like you're really excited about. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they're amazing uh, founder, um, very coachable, right? And so you can tell um by the energy kind of in the field and kind of what the traction um has been in such a short amount of time it's like this person's going to like knock it out of the park and so that's very interesting to see um at different levels so for me i i like being early stage and seeing later shades i've i've, I've also seen like pre-pad and work finally get their pad in and they're moving on and so but this is just like different type of energy that, that you can see so from a time a founder first contacts you, how, how many touches or how long does it take for you to like decide, okay, I'm going to invest this person. I know it depends, but on general, like, is it like six months later, 10 meetings later, you know, it's very different. Like I've seen different, um, different companies, like different firms or just, they have a different, um, threshold, I think for for the way that they invest and like the way that they take deal flow, right? So like we were talking about earlier, if if they are a firm that has, um, like they've been there for a while, like they're going to see, uh, they have a playbook likely. Okay, they meet these parameters. This is what they need. Okay, uh, this is pretty solid investment. Um, and maybe everything's laid out. Like you, we both know like what the check size will be when you come to me. And so those can kind of be like, just maybe a two, you know, whatever meeting turnaround. Um, but it really depends. Like if I've known you forever and I know like that your work ethic and I, it's going to be very different. Right. So it's hard to say like from one meeting, there's no standard. So a lot of times, no founders, they'll go pitch an investor, you know, have a good meeting. And oftentimes the investor will say, well, we like what you're doing, you know, blase, blase, you know, great pitch, you know, on and on. However, you know, we just can't pitch it. You don't have no traction. Mm -hmm. So when they say that, is that to the founders take that as that, you know, no, they're really interested. We just got to get more traction and get more customers. Or is that really code for no? We're not going to invest in you. You know, it's okay. If, if you don't meet the thesis, obviously like they, they'll likely say it's a solid no. Mm -hmm. Right. If you have the capability of being in that space and at the current time you don't fit it, then, you know, it could be the traction, it could be something else. And so that is a way to one, either encourage you, like you might be really close, but you need a certain thing or um, just to kind of keep you in the orb, right? They want to see that you're doing the updates. So don't take it as a complete like negative. Um, just come back and, you know, and you're going to be moving in like the update, like, section now yeah i think founders have to keep in mind i think what you, you hear like 300 no's before you get a yes or some high number like that you gotta you have to go through a lot of no's right yeah and i mean like traction yeah there's 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 a lot of no's there could be a lot like hey maybe you came in too late right let's say the I've funds a, already been done funds or... already been done but i know i'm raising another fund so then you're kind of in that cycle and obviously i'm going to start pre-planning who i would accept mm -hmm. into the new fund so that's a chance, right? Don't completely, I see folks like bashing, oh man, he just told me like, I can't, I'm not investable right now. And they, they take it so hard. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, hey, just play the game. And the game at the moment is like, you currently don't fit. You're obviously not gonna change their mind right now. The only way you'll change their mind is if you, you know, send these updates, tell them about your traction and then like keep moving on. Um, try to get debriefed, but often, um, most VCs won't give you a debrief just because they want you like to figure it out or they honestly might not be the domain expert and they don't really know like which lever in your whole entire business model that you need to switch up. 
They just know that you need to to have a certain metric. So some, so you know, a good question to be like, okay, um, like what would you need to see in order for this to look appealing to you? And so if they can answer something in that realm, like that's helpful. Like I'd like to see more users. I'd like to see your users paying a higher volume. Um, kind of helps get some direction. So from your point of view, how much responsibility should VCs have on educating founders and how the quote unquote game works? I, being me, I like the idea of educating like founders, right? People are not gonna know you necessarily how to pitch perfect the first time. They're not gonna know um, funding cycles, check sizes. I really think that people should be moving towards educating um, the particular founder that comes through the door. Cause it's either, either for their own benefit or, or for another like firm's benefit. But like we've always seen like part of the game is understanding what to do and what not to do, right? And so how can I present my best self if I don't even know what you're looking for, right? And so that's why a lot of VCs um, like the warm introduction. They like to know that you know someone that kind of knows how we operate. Um, but with a lot of research, like like Crunchbase and PitchBook, um, press releases and following some of your competitors, you can kind of get an idea like, okay, they got, a, they got 1 million at this valuation and they have so many customers, et cetera. Um, so that way, you know, like the type of information that they like to be presented. So I guess the catch 22, it's like, we want, you want the founder to also be engaged as well, right? Like, I don't want a founder sending a thousand emails, just like <laughs> blank market it and not really give a shit, right? And so you want, I think it's a reciprocated um, can you talk about the points of founders like putting themselves out there? So you say like going to pitch competitions, networking, meeting people and all mm -hmm. that, you know, personal brand, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said earlier, if you are not that CEO that can get on stage that can sell your company and you're not that person, like you're going to need to either become that person pretty fast because like that's your whole brand, right? How are you going to get customers if you can't sell the VC, if you can't pitch, um, so it's really important is to just kind of put yourself out there. Like a lot of folks like, oh, someone's going to steal my idea. Like, <laughs> honestly, if your idea is that easily like stealable, then, then maybe you should be rethinking it. Um, but folks, um, the faster that you're able to kind of put yourself out there, um, the more feedback that you're going to get, right? What you see is a lot of folks building in their garage, you know, they're like six months, heads in the ground doing something. And by the time they come to the market, it's like, nah, like we really wanted something completely different. So, you know, most founders are telling you, know, keep on grinding, don't give up, you know, hustle, 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 push on, you know, get all, all the obstacles, you know, never give up. But when should a founder give up? Like when should a founder say, you know what? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even talking about pivot, like just give up, like, okay, like, this is not working for me. When should a founder say, okay, this is like not working for me? That's a hard one. Um, I, we've seen a lot of failures. So the thing about like our region is folks really talk about it. Oftentimes we've seen, okay, someone got a really large funding round and I'm very like new. I only have a couple of founders in this space. Like my competitive advantage isn't that great. Am I going to be able to catch up to that like funding round? Right. So at that point, you'd consider like, hey, can I get acquired? Can I build up a customer base that they'd want instead of like having to build it themselves? They could just acquire me. Um, so that's an option. And then like basically if you're just going to quit, it's literally on you, right? Like are you able as a person, your family responsibilities, et cetera, like to continue to drive? So like I said, it's competition um, and personal like perseverance in this particular space. Um, some of your advisors, you know, um, might be able to tell you, hey, like this landscape is uh, becoming really competitive. For instance, like if you're working on like a telehealth, right? You literally just saw that whole entire market like flipped 
overnight and like quarter one of this year, so many investments went into like mental health, telehealth, like, et cetera. You, you have to take a, a, like a step back now and be like, okay, am I at the right time and right place for this? Do I need to put it aside and then wait for the right timing to be available? Um, because at the end of the day, like you're burning money, the more that you continue to pursue it. And so that's why most people, you know, like they fail. It's either because the team didn't work out or the money ran out. I was listening to a podcast a while ago about a company. This is a long time ago. They were making a calendar, right? They're going to charge money for a calendar. And then mm -hmm. six months later, Google came out with a free calendar, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, kind of like crush them, right? That happens too. Um, it's really interesting. So being in Austin, we have South by Southwest. So we know we bring like 100,000 innovators a year. And, um, you know, people have great successes, like Twitter, like, like folks launching here. And then the next year they become exponentially larger. But we also see like these topics, right? So for instance, like if it's a blockchain, if it's whatever it might be, and like the following year, we'll see so many startups in that same space. It's cause they like, there's some like, you know, thought knowledge like going around and like they'll create this and they think that they have like a, the, the winning like business to, to combat the whatever challenge it is or the market. Um, and then they realize like, oh my gosh, there's like 10 other people doing the same exact thing, right? And so that's like some of the like founder resiliency and, and knowing what you're doing. Are you gonna execute better? You know, recruit a better team? Correct. Correct, yeah. So I always like, you know, founders to, to stay aware. Like if you come in and say you don't have a competitor, then like you're totally <laughs> full of shit because like, there's always a competitor, right? Even if it's a corporate too, like mm -hmm. Google or Amazon, you know, if, if they're working on something in your lane, you need to be really mindful of like where they're at with it because if it comes out, then. So is South by Southwest, is, it the, is the hype real? Is that really that great at an event? Oh, South by Southwest is, is amazing. Yeah. Um, it, and it really depends. Like, so there's different reasons. Uh, we have film, we have music. Um, but most people talk about South by Southwest because it's like an innovation um, track there. And so you have uh, all the folks from across the world. So there's a particular um, conference section there and you'll have like Tokyo and Africa and all of the top like countries across the world. They'll bring some of their top founders from their ecosystems to come and like display the tech and network. And so I know even like last year, like from London, like we were just hanging out for lunch. And so it was really interesting is that you can kind of run and, and meet so many folks. Um, and then obviously like South by Southwest pitch competitions, uh, those have always produced some good like winners. Yeah, I gotta imagine, you gotta, I gotta imagine you gotta be top notch even to be accepted, even compete in those things. Yeah, and you know, and there's like particular, and it doesn't have to be just, it's all different types of tech. So we have like ed tech, um, you could be doing like health. So last year, like Dr. Everlin from UT, she developed the mass spec pen, which basically like when you're in surgery, you could put the pen against the tissue and uh, you can tell with a certain degree of accuracy whether that tissue is cancerous, right? So before you'd have to remove a huge section without knowing, but like live in surgery, like you can test the tissue, which is a great innovation, right? Um, and so they just re recently started a company. And so I think that was about two years ago where they were at South by Southwest. Now it's a full-fledged company and they're growing. So you see a lot of different types of innovation. So you're from San Antonio, but currently live in Austin, Texas, correct? Yes. So someone is gonna come visit San Antonio, never been there before. What's the one thing they need to go see in San Antonio or do in San Antonio? One thing they need to see? Or do. Yeah. Never been there before. What's the one thing they have to see and do, or do? Oh, that's a hard one. San Antonio is like a huge small town. So it is actually, it is, it is it's, yeah. Because it, it's so uh, like the culture there is really dynamic. Um, I would say, you know, everyone says it. So like the river walk, <laughs> um, but like on a culturally appropriate holiday. So if you tie it against like 
like Christmas or um, like a Spanish cultural event. So like we obviously have like Fiesta or Dia de los Muertos. Like it's a chance to see like the city um, and its cultural best with like um, like like uh, folklorical dances and all of the great things that come with San Antonio having been like under Mexican rule for so long, right? Before even the United States even set the boundaries there. So. And then the same question for Austin. Oh, Austin. Oh, what do you got to do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Austin's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to just go kayak on the lake, pretty much Barton Springs and just kind of really enjoy like city life, but also on the water. So that's what I would do when you come here. Um, and then obviously like good drinks. And so we have a lot of, um, like speakeasies or uh, bars that have codes. So you have to kind of get this code in advance and it's a very limited like room. Those are always fun to go to. So do you have a favorite barbecue place? Uh, yes, La Barbecue, my favorite. So uh, the Pitmasters at Franklin's, um, one of their understudies went and started um, their own on the east side. And that's in Austin? That's in Austin, yep. And your favorite uh, place for Mexican food? Favorite place for Mexican food? Um, I really like churros downtown. In San Antonio? Uh, or in Austin? In Austin. Okay. In San Antonio, you definitely want to go to Mi Tierra. It is downtown. It is the like longest stay Mexican, most traditional restaurant. They'll have the mariachis. They'll have the tres leches cake and everything. So next, let's talk about Bunker Labs and your role with them. You've been a, you're a sealer out of Austin for Bunker Labs. I think you've been there, you're going on two years now. Talk about your role with them. Yeah, so our role here is to work with our military connected community entrepreneurs, uh, everything from idea stage to those that have, you know, raised a million or they're doing 500K ARR. Um, and you're really connecting them to your ecosystem. So in this particular case, it's like, how to progress and grow these, these entrepreneurs that don't necessarily um, have a connected network, right? So someone lands in Austin, uh, we have a couple of different programs. So like I said, Idea Sage, if you're just transitioning, what to do, what not to do. Um, there's a veterans and residents program. It's like a, it's a biannual um, incubator accelerator itself. And that allows the founders to one, develop themselves, um, as CEOs, help them find, you know, co-founders and then meet the next milestone. And so those milestones could be uh, uh, the investment round. It could be um, like what we're like the traction. And then we also have a program for to connect founders who actually already have like received funding or have the traction with executives like uh, Howard Schultz from Starbucks or from Dell is to now, how do I become an actual full fledged organization and like what that structure looks like. So if it's IT structure, et cetera. And you've been with them for like two years, I think. Two years, yeah. So what's, how to put this. So what's the success metrics for Bunker Labs from your point of view? Is it like you, you have the ten, eight companies in VIR and six raise money, or is it six of them learn while well, this is next for us, or is the success metric different for each company from your point of view? Each company has a different, uh, so we're industry agnostic. So that basically means any type of company, um, any vertical can come in uh, there. It's actually moving them against the milestones that they have set out for themselves. And uh, it's moving the tick mark um, for those entrepreneurs especially if it requires connecting to different ecosystems. So we definitely, we have a national presence. And so if somebody needs to be connected, like, like to Ohio or to New York, you know, and they're in their distribution channels, then we would assist them in progressing in, in that manner. Um, so we don't like take equity or anything like that. And so like, it's mainly to get these military entrepreneurs to you know, to progress in their ecosystem. We know that like large companies like Nike and UPS, et cetera, were built by military entrepreneurs. And so it is a way to build like long stay um, economic, you know, progression 
And one thing I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize in the military, we're all on a little bubble, right? You know, you know, Fort Lewis bubble, Fort Hood bubble. So you might be a Fort Hood, but odds you coming down to Austin and network, you know, with tech people probably slim down and right. So I think Buckle Labs does a good job of, you know, exposing people to those different networks, right? Yeah. So like, for instance, let's say somebody lands um, and what we see, like, folks have varied interests, but like, there's, our city leads know all the investors, they know other founders and entrepreneurs, they know all the accelerators. So it's easily able to roadmap, hey, you're going to go to this accelerator next, you're going to go talk to this investor. And the founder themselves probably would have been waiting six months or so to figure it out on his, him, himself. And by that time, the company could close down. So oftentimes, it's, it's the difference between um, like going further. So Shady, is this something that I should have asked you that it, that it didn't? Mm, oh, there's lots of things. <laughs> we had discussed this before. So I'm like, obviously pretty like down to earth. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned like, I'm from San Antonio. And it's really important to know that like, that's really where the journey started. Right. Um, my dad was trying to bring an innovation to market, like when I was 10 years old, and we didn't have access to any of that. And so it literally wasn't patented for like, I think 15 years, 10 years or so. And, um, you know, looking back, it was almost like if that opportunity would have been there, if there would have been a connected network, then he could have moved something along, right? And so growing up in that particular area and seeing um, like Graham Weston, who's a super advocate here in San Antonio, um, building out rack space, literally like on my old side of town, it was really interesting to see how like VC and investment and directed um, opportunities to different networks can really advance an ecosystem. So then like that was over what, 12 years ago. So San Antonio was starting to get a small tech innovation ecosystem. And so I would like challenge and like other folks to understand that if your particular market doesn't have an ecosystem that you, you can be that person like moving it forward. Shady, how is it important to you to be like a role model mentor to other people moving forward? That's, I think that's always been my goal is if I can make it and I can show people how to get there, like every time I break down a door, like I literally open up um, resources to like folks that follow me. Um, so for me, it's, I think it's a really high priority is to, is to make it, uh, especially in the VC lane. And so then you can bring all of those resources back to the particular community. Shady, can you tell us, uh, tell people how to reach out to you? Um, yeah, so obviously you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, so it's Shady De Jesus, Slim Shady. No, it's uh, S H A Y D I De Jesus. Um, and then also on Twitter, it's just at Shady De Jesus as well. And we have the links to our social media on our show notes and the show notes at www.cavenshlblog.com. So let's talk about your Slim Shady uh, nickname. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's up? <laughs> how'd that come about? Is, is, is someone gave it to you? You gave it to yourself? So my name is Shady um, and Slim Shady. He actually released the album um, very close to my birthday. Okay. I didn't, okay. And so, um, yeah, so I showed up at the lunchroom and everyone's like, oh my gosh, real Slim Shady, <laughs> you know, and they started rapping. And so that's actually a big part of my like life. So that's pretty, that's pretty fun. Yeah. And then like networking events, everything. Like, Definitely to make, I mean, Slim Shady's Shady. already a unique, unique name, yeah. right? Slim Shady. So by by default, I, I rap probably every other day. <laughs> so, uh, Slim, what kind of the end of our talk? Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Um, I'd say I'd like to, like, for folks to challenge, like, the status quo, you know. Um, my, my particular advice in that is, like, I never seen – or would have thought I, I would be in the circles and doing the things that I am now like 10 years ago, right? Um, and the more that I pushed forward, the more that I was able to break down doors and glass ceilings. And so now like everything seems pretty limitless. And so for a lot of founders out there, they just feel like they're gonna win overnight. And then most folks are not gonna win overnight. It's like a 10 year journey, it's a five year journey. 
Um, and I've seen folks that raise several rounds and they're still like needing to raise more rounds to go forward. Um, so just, you know, really believe in yourself, surround yourself with other folks that, you know, believe in yourself, but also challenge you to be better. Um, because if you just have folks that literally are telling you that you're the best all the time, like you're never going to be that founder or, or get to that point that you're looking for. Sadie, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. This has been great. All right. Thank you. And so listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. All right, we'll stop.